Okay, I'll start. So, thank you for coming. And I appreciate that, um, as expected, there's a, a mixed audience of mathematicians and physicists. So, um, this first lecture will just consist of an extended introduction with lots of examples. Um, I'll explain for mathematicians what a Feynman integral is and why it's of interest to number theorists. And I will try to, in the second half, illustrate um, for the benefit of physicists what this Galois, cosmic Galois group does and why it's a very, very powerful tool in understanding amplitudes. I also appreciate that you might not want to listen to me droning on for eight hours. So at least in this lecture, you'll see everything that's, that's going to happen in the course. So this is just um, introduction. And examples. So the, the goal is to define and study a Galois theory of uh, Feynman amplitudes. In a completely rigorous manner, there will be no, nothing conjectural about this at all. Um, and I should really mention my uh, intellectual debt. So the, the inspiration, the story behind this is, is quite a long one. But um, I believe it started off with calculations due to Broadhurst and Kreimer in the 90s, in particular in 95, who found um, multiple zeta values which I'll define later, as amplitudes in a massless fight the four theory, which is a certain physical theory, which I'll come to later. Um, OK, so multiple zeta values are certain numbers. And um, a few years earlier, Deline, Yahara, and Drinfeld independently, and at exactly the same time, in 89, um, had developed the theory of the of, of the motivic fundamental group, P1 minus three points. And the sort of philosophy that emerges from this is that these numbers, multiple zeta values, are intimately related to a certain group called the motivic Galois group of a certain category called mixed tape motives over Z, which at the time didn't exist. And all that was conjectural at that time. Um, so what happened next is that Cartier in around 1998, said, well, we have um, amplitudes in physics related to numbers in mathematics that are related to some motivic Galois group. Well, could there be, and he coined the term cosmic, so do, could, could there be a cosmic Galois group that, um, that somehow acts on these amplitudes and corresponds to this, uh, this group here, which, we, which was conjectured to be underlying the structure of multiple zeta values. So he made some vague statements, but he, he in invented the word cosmic Galois group. Um, another important contribu contribution was due to Konsevich in 1998, who uh, suggested um, counting points of graph hypersurfaces over finite fields about which I won't say much, um, but it's proved to be a very useful tool in, in trying to understand the structure of, of amplitudes. Um, I should certainly mention work of Alain Cohn and Mathilde Marcoli, who in 2004 and 5 uh, wrote a paper in which they constructed what they called, and I'll put it in inverted commas because it's different from what I'm going to define. So they constructed a cosmic Galois group. Um, and it is related to the renormalization group. So I'm not going to say anything about this uh, in this course at all. It's just so that you're aware that there is a phrase out there, cosmic Galois group in the literature. I don't know of any connection with what I'm going to do. And I won't say anything about this. 
Um, then an important contribution due to Belkali and Brosnan in uh, 2003, um, which started to cast some doubt on whether amplitudes in this theory were in fact multiple zeta values at all. But yes. So they found that graph hypersurfaces um, are of general type. In other words, when you take, you look at the, the you count points over finite fields of um, hypersurfaces defined from Feynman graphs, you get pretty much anything possible. Um, but their counterexamples, as you mentioned, were physically completely un unrealistic. So they corresponded to graphs which would um, never occur in any quantum field theory. So when you say they found multiple zeta values, does it mean they found them in a few cases or for an infinite series of all the graphs? No, a few cases. That, so that, no, until very recently there were no infinite families known. As you just the beginning of the symptotic is not... They just began, they, well, I'll come to their results um, later in the second half. They computed numerically many examples. Um, I can't tell you how many, but a convincing number. And they found that they agreed up to very high precision with multiple zeta values. So they did a numerical fit. Uh, we start proving the exact no, they didn't prove that they didn't prove the except in some a handful of cases that the amplitude was actually a multiple zeta value. It was just verified numerically to a high accuracy. Broadhurst and Krimer. So I'll, I'll come to that later. This is I'm being sketchy here, but I want to mention everything that that um, that came before. Um, another important contribution is a, a paper by Bloch, Eno, and Kreimer um, in 2006, who um, defined what they called the motive of um, a certain family of graphs in this theory called primitive graphs in, in this particular theory, five, four, and four dimensions. And um, there's been a huge amount of recent work um, that I'm not going to say very much about at all, I'm afraid, because time is, is shorter than I, than I expected. I will mention the names of my collaborators, um, Dimitri Dorin, Eric Panzer, um, Oliver Schnetz, and Karen Yates who have um, enormously influenced the way I think about, about this. Um, but the, the bottom line of qu quite a large body of work is that we now know um, that there exist amplitudes in phi to the fourth theory, in this particular theory, um, which are in fact not, or expected not to be multiple zeta values. So this initial sort of correspondence sort of doesn't really work. And in fact, this, the story is even more complicated than that because not all multiple zeta values actually occur as MZVs. So it would seem that this whole project, this, and, sorry? <laughs> yeah, I think that statement's false. <laughs> Thank you, as I'm fatigued. Thank you for that. Uh, certainly in, 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 in 5.4. So the initial analogy um, that inspired Cartier to, to coin this cosmic Galois group has sort of fallen apart because amplitudes are much, much more complicated than multiple zeta values. And in fact, um, the story is much more intricate than anybody imagined. Um, but the point of this course is to say that, in fact, despite this complexity, this idea of a cosmic Galois group holds in some sense. And that's what I want to explain. So in this course, um, we will define um, an affine group scheme 
This is slightly inaccurate. It'll, it'll already be several affine group schemes, but for the introduction, this will do. An affine group scheme over Q, DC, cosmic Galois group, and associate to a um, to certain families. Um, of Feynman amplitudes it'll be extremely general by the way um, the, 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 the certain will be a very small restriction so these amplitudes will now in fact will be very general they will depend on arbitrary masses and arbitrary momenta so two such families of Feynman amplitudes we will associate a um, motivic period Um, that I will write I subs subscript M G M Q and um, we will be able to speak of um, the Galois conjugates uh, G of I M masses and momenta um, for any element in this group. So from an amplitude you get something you get something new. So remark I use the word motivic um, in homage to, to Grottendieck because all of these ideas really come from his work. But motives play no role in this and the theory will be entirely um, rigorous and there will be no conjectures except today there will be some conjectures but in, for the rest I won't so as part of a very special case of this theory here I'm speaking to physicists um, we will retrieve the notion of the symbol of an amplitude so this is um, become an industry, a huge industry recently in um, high energy physics. Um, the symbol is only defined for a very particular class of amplitudes which happen to be polylogarithms. In fact, the motivic period is, is, will be hold for everything. And the, and the symbol is a, is a much weaker notion than the motivic period. But we will retrieve this and be able to s state general theorems about them. Out of this theory, as a side effect, will also pop out the renormalization group, and in particular the Kronkheimer Hopf algebra of graphs of renormalization. In the third lecture, I'll explain that. So this will come out for free, although the precise connection between the, the actual renormalization group and the cosmic Galois group remains to be worked out. And a third consequence of this theory, which is what I want to talk about today, is that it implies a very subtle um, recursive structure um, on amplitudes and it gives phenomenal constraints on what you expect to find as amplitudes. So in particular it has a practical application to the study of Feynman. Is there any connection of this with the recent work of Nima, Gunchero, Paulson? Um, I don't know. Um, so from what I've understood, these are um, amplitudes in N equals 4 super Yang mills. Um, my understanding is there's been a, a huge progress in understanding the integrands, organizing the integrand structure for N equals 4 super Yang mills, for which it wasn't a priori clear how to write that down. But the actual integration, where you actually integrate over some domain, is still completely uh, open from that point of view, it seems. So when you say motives play no role, so we are supposed to understand that the cosmic Galois group is not like the Tanakian group of some category. You're jumping ahead. Um, yes, no, it, okay, for, for, for just for OFA, it, the, it will be a quotient of, what I'll do is I'll define a representation of the Tanaka group of a category of realizations. 
I will work with the Katku, Tanaki and Katku of realizations, and that has a, a group. But every time I give myself something that comes from algebraic geometry, the group action on it will be the correct one. Will be? Well, well, is expected to be the correct one. If there was an abelian category of mixed motives, it should give exactly the same answer. So it's a way to get around all the conjectures. Ah, so you don't construct a category? No, no, I'm not constructing category of motives. I, I will explain all of this. Ooh. Is, this, uh, is this broken or is it a strength, strength test? Okay, I'll give up. <laughs> oh, so it is a, strength, a, a test of strength. Oh. <laughs> so you will have both invented and destroyed the cosmic Gallo group. <laughs> okay, so now Feynman graphs. So I will consider um, scalar, a scalar quantum field theory in, um, in Euclidean space. So R to the D, oops, D where D is an even number. So even number of space-time dimensions. Um, so a Feynman graph um, will be a connected graph. Later on I might make them not connected, but for today they're all connected. So a graph G is um, a set of vertices, a set of internal edges, and a set of external edges. So V is um, a set of vertices. EG are ed internal edges, so these are pairs of vertices, not necessarily distinct. And very often, these edges will, in fact, be labeled. Um, and um, yes, absolutely. And we can have uh, tadpoles as well. Absolutely. And then we will have um, external half edges. Which are called uh, legs by physicists. So we have a graph, some topological data, and um, there's kinematic data. Um, one, a particle mass, Me, so it'll be a real number for every. E and EG, and to a, an incoming momentum, QI, which is a, a, a vector in the R to the D, where D is the number of space-time dimensions, for every um, external. Half edge, um, subject to momentum conservation which is that the sum of all the incoming momenta uh, is zero. And, and sometimes I'll, I will need to specify which masses are going to be zero and which aren't. Likewise, which momenta we're allowed to take to be zero and which aren't. And so to do this, it's convenient to draw massive lines, massive edges, um, 
that is to say those with ME not equal to zero, as uh, thickened lines. OK, so here's an example of a Feynman graph. Um, let me, oops, maybe I should do it like this. That's better. So we'll have uh, Q2, Q3, and Q1. And uh, this means that we have masses M1 and M2, which will be non-zero. But the mass of the third particle here is zero. And momentum conservation tells us that Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3 equals zero. Um, Um, it doesn't matter because in the formulae we will always take the square of the mass. Um, oh yeah. And I will always replace, um, if we have a graph with several incoming momenta, Q1, Q2, up to Qn, we can always replace it with a single uh, external leg, which carries the sum of the momenta. So if you like, this defines an equivalence relation on these graphs. OK, so I'm going to say something slightly tedious, but it will be important for later on. Um, so I won't spend too long on it. We can specify the set of edges with vanishing the set of vanishing um, masses and momenta. In some sense, I want to think of each, each graph comes with the data of which momenta and masses are, are non-zero. And um, each such family will define a motivic period. So what that means is that we will view uh, the Feynman amplitude which I'm about to define, I, G, which is a function of these masses and the momenta, as a function. So here we, we should say what we mean by function. It can be multi-valued in general. That means it's a function on some choice of universal covering of some space. It may, be, it may even be well, uh, ill-defined. So it may be infinite everywhere. So when I write a Feynman integral, sometimes it, I will not assume that it converges. It will just be a, an, a formal expression. <coughs> so it will be a function on the complex points of an affine, affine variety. Um, M G index V, which is, I'll just write the set of masses and momenta where the momenta, the, the masses are in A1 minus zero for all E in, not in Vm. And um, the momenta will be in affine D space, non-zero for I not in VQ. OK. And, oh, I forgot something. Subject, of course, subject to, to the momentum conservation condition. So this is a sort of space on which we want to view um, the Feynman amplitude, if, it's, if it converges, it will have singularities all over the place. Q. 
I'm lost, sorry? Here. Here? Oh, no, no, no. It was safe. An edge. An edge. edge, yeah. So this is, we specify some set of edges for which the masses vanish, some set of edges for which the masses don't vanish. <coughs> Likewise for the momenta. What I don't understand how to do is, is take a limit as a mass goes to zero, or as a momentum goes to zero. That's very tricky. So that's a, a question that I won't address at all in these lectures. So I want to specify who is zero and who is non-zero. And for mathematicians, the, the Euclidean region, so what it means to be in Euclidean as opposed to Minkowski space, is just the set of real, means we restrict to the set of real points of this uh, variety. Okay. Oh dear. Okay, so now to define the um, Feynman amplitude. So I'm going to, to jump in and define the Feynman amplitudes directly in parametric space, which is very old-fashioned, and um, the younger physicists are maybe not so familiar with it. But it's in all the, the, the derivation from the momentum space representation is in all the textbooks. Um, so you trust me that it, it works, and it, it always works. So th this is a sort of 1960s presentation of Feynman amplitudes. And it involves graph polynomials. <coughs> so a um, spanning K tree written T equals T1 mu TK um, is a subgraph um, with K connected components. which are the TIs, and each TI is a tree. Um, so it has no, no loops in it. Such that um, the vertices of these trees cover all the vertices of the graph. So the vertices of G is the disjoint union of the vertex set of each T, of the, of the union of the vertices of the Ts. <coughs> and then um, some terminology to each internal edge of the graph, we associate uh, what first is called a Schwinger parameter. Alpha e. <coughs> and then from this we define a couple of polynomials. Kirchhoff polynomial graph polynomial. This is often called the first Semanzic polynomial. And it is written Psi G equals the sum over all um, spanning one trees in the graph. And then for every such tree you take the product um, over edges not in that tree of alpha e. And so this is a polynomial in uh, the string of parameters and it has coefficients in z. Spanning one tree. T, T is a spanning one tree, so maybe I should write T equals T1. So this is span, spanning one tree according to the definition at the top. Okay. Um, and then now, oh yeah, so the second Samanzic. Um, that I'm going to denote by phi g q. It's now going to depend on the momenta. It's the sum over now spanning two trees. I'll write it more neatly this time. 
spanning two trees. OG, and we take the product of the edges not in the union of these trees, alpha E times QT1 squared, where um, QT1 also equal to minus QT2 is the total momentum that is incoming that comes into T1. And the square, I, I nearly forgot to say, um, if when D dimensions, so QI has components. Uh, Q1 up to QD, let's say, then the square is Euclidean norm. Uh. <coughs> okay. An, an interesting fact which, which actually gives rise to all this arithmetic coming out of quantum field theory is the fact that these polynomials here and here have integer coefficients. And that's the fact that's almost never used in, in physics. Um, sorry? They have the fact that this has integer coefficients is very important because it gives all the arithmetic. Um, and it's almost never used. So let's do an example. Um, so let's do uh, this graph again. T3. So the spanning one trees are. Um, one, two, three, two, and uh, one, three. And so the first semantic polynomial or Kirchhoff polynomial is the sum of the complement, the products of the complements of the edges in each spanning tree. So here it's just alpha three, here it's just alpha one, and here it's alpha two. And the spanning two trees. are um, edge one and this isolated vertex here, this vertex here and edge three, um, and then this vertex and edge two. And so phi g of q is equal to, so we take the momentum, the total momentum going into, into one of these trees, so let's say this vertex, that's, that's just Q1. And then we take the product of all the edges not in the spanning tree. So that's alpha 2, alpha 3. And of course, if I took the momentum in, into the other tree, you'd get 2Q plus Q3. But because of momentum conservation, um, that's the same thing as, as Q1 squared. Here we get. Um, Q3 squared, alpha 1, alpha 2. And the last graph, we get Q2 squared, alpha 1, alpha 3. <coughs> OK, so we get some very concrete polynomials coming from graphs. Um, some remarks, which is that psi g is always homogeneous. And its degree is hg which is the, um, the Betty number, first Betty number of the graph. Uh, in the, the standard definition. Um, and, physicists, and I will often call this the loop number, the number of loops of a graph. It's just the uh, dimension of H1. Uh, and then phi g, as a function of the alphas, is um, homogeneous as well, but of degree one more.
Okay. <clears throat> and finally, we let define a third polynomial that I will call xi. I don't think this is standard terminology to call this xi, but um, it suited me. Xi m comma g will be uh, the second semantic polynomial plus the sum over all internal edges, the mass squared of that edge times alpha e multiplied by psi g. So in this example, we get, uh, I'll write it out, Um, then alpha 1 plus alpha 2 plus alpha 3. I'm sorry, how much do you know what is the basic degrees? In the alphas? In the alphas. Yeah, I said this in, in, in okay. yes, in the alpha e's, absolutely. Okay. Good. Um, okay, so now for the Feynman integral, which will be constructed out of these polynomials. Number three. So this is the Feynman integral in parametric form. Um, yeah, so let me write ng for the number of edges, of internal edges in the graph for the time being. Um, and then the Feynman integral IG of M, Q, and it also depends on the dimension, but I'm really going really to fix the dimension for most of, most of the time. Um, it's gamma d over 2 integral sigma omega g omega q d where <coughs> omega g m q d is um, it's one over the first semantic polynomial to the d over two times so mq uh, to the power of ng minus hg d over 2. This is why we want to take the dimension to be even, to avoid having square roots everywhere, times omega g. So I have sigma. I'm, I'm coming to that. Um, first, omega g. So omega g is sum i equals 1 to ng minus 1 to the i alpha i. And you omit, omit alpha, d alpha i ng. Um, and sigma is a certain locus in projective space of dimension ng minus 1. It's real points. So it's the coordinate simplex. It's the real coordinate simplex. Actually, maybe I'll write it here. 
put this board to some use. So sigma is the, um, in projective coordinates, it's the region where the alpha ngs, so alpha i is in real and non-negative. Okay, some remarks. Oh, so of course I should say this, this may be an ill-defined integral. It may, may diverge. And most of the time it will diverge badly. <clears throat> okay, some remarks. Um, is that the integrand omega g m q d is um, homogeneous of degree zero? So it's a small calculation. We we know what the degrees of psi g and phi g are. I told you here, and you plug it into the formula, and one has to check that it's homogeneous of degree zero in the alphas. Um, and once you've made that remark, then indeed the integral does make sense as a projective integral. If you don't like that, you can always restrict to an affine chart by setting one of the alphas to, to one, for example, and you get a, a standard integral over, over r, r to the n minus one or something. Um, another remark is that um, the amplitudes in a general, i.e. not necessarily scalar, quantum field theory are much more complicated, but they can be expressed in parametric form using similar integrals but um, with numerators. So the numerators will be some sort of polynomials in the alphas with coefficients in some, uh, some uh, Clifford algebra or something. Um, the point is that the, the, the geometry of the Feynman integral um, will not depend on the, the numerators. So um, I expect and I hope that everything that I say can be extended to more general quantum field theories. But for now, um, it's not much of a restriction to consider the scalar case for this reason. Yeah. Why did you include the exponential factor? The exponential factor? Which, uh, Which exponential factor? Which regularize in the uh, infrared for uh, large alphas? Um, not sure. I mean, uh, I'm not sure I see what you mean. That, so when you derive this, there's an, there's an exponential, and um, that produces this gamma, this gamma term here. But this is not regularized in, in any way. Th so if you take the, if you take the, the, the momentum space definition of, of a Feynman integral, and you do the Schwinger trick, and you do the um, um, momentum integrals using Gaussian formula for Gaussian integral, you get a formula very close to this. But there is still the exponential uh, in terms of the mass. Yeah, so that, okay, so that, that's how you pass, so you have an e to the minus something, um, and then that's, that's where you pass to, okay, yeah. So if you work in affine space, you get an integral like you say, with an e to the minus something, and then you can do one more integ integral, integrate out, if you get e to the minus, a graph polynomial times lambda, because it's homogeneous, you integrate out lambda, which will spit out this gamma function, and then you get a projective integral. So this is one, one stage further than the normal affine. Maybe you're thinking of the, the parametric integral with a delta, with a delta function, and yeah, okay. Um, and the remark that maybe not all mathematicians are aware of is that almost all um, the predictions for um, 
collider experiments are obtained um, from computing such quantities. And that's why the, the calculation of Feynman integrals is, is an enormous, uh, enormous industry. So perhaps uh, before having a break, I'll just give some, some first examples of Feynman amplitudes and try to convince you that, they're, that you get interesting quantities um, from them. So here are some um, a sort of random selection of examples from the literature. Um, so at one loop, uh, what are the sort of things you can get? A one loop graph would be uh, this triangle graph that we looked at earlier with some choice of masses and momenta. It doesn't really matter which. Other examples would be polygons like this. Maybe with many momenta. Uh, this is in d equals four dimensions. Then uh, all these families of Feynman integrals, um, it turns out, is always uh, expressible in terms of two functions. Um, the logarithm, which I will write in this way, Li1 of x equals minus log 1 minus x. And the dialogarithm, Li2 of x equals sum x to the k over k squared. So this is, I don't know if who was the first to observe this, but it was, um, there's a, a beautiful paper by Davidichev and Del Bugo where this is explained. So you only need essentially these two functions to describe all the Feynman amplitudes at one loop. Um, and what are the arguments of these dialogues and logarithms? Well, there will be some complicated the arguments will be some complicated um, algebraic functions, perhaps with a square root thrown in there, of the masses and the momenta. <coughs> I should say this mass squares and momenta. <coughs> no, sorry, I won't say that. So that's really it for one loops, one loop rather. Um, two loops gets more interesting. Um, one example that's been massively studied in recent years and has quite a long history is the sunrise diagram. Again, with you've got three possible masses and, and one momentum coming in. So let me give you the graph polynomials just for, for fun. And if I do Q, Q squared, alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3. Um, and this has a very long history. Um, but the upshot is that this, uh, f these families of Feynman integrals give elliptic dialogarithms. And the most recent work on this is due to Adams, Bogner, and Weinziel. So presumably in their references, there's the full history of this um, family of integrals. 
Um, but the remark is that uh, the general two-loop diagram, general two-loop amplitude is, I believe, not known. So what, what does that mean, not known? Uh, it means that it's some function which doesn't have a description in terms of familiar mathematical objects. Um, there is a vast array of examples which uh, can be expressed in terms of polylogarithms, multiple polylogarithms. In fact, the literature, physics literature, is, is full of such calculations. And um, there are other interesting examples for number theorists like myself, at least, um, such as uh, these family of graphs, Bn. So here we need d equals two dimensions. And so n edges. So these were talked about recently by David Broadhurst in this very room not long ago. So here you take q equals naught. So q equals naught means I may omit to, to draw the external momentum. I'll just put a, a little small line like that to illustrate that it's zero. And all the masses are equal to one. So perhaps I should thicken these lines. I beg your pardon? Sorry? Oh, the n can be anything. Yeah, that was, two, that was the end of two loops. And then two, the two loop story stops because we don't, we're stuck. Um, and now, now this is just a different family of examples. So n bigger than or equal to 2. And um, so here the, the, the polynomial xi doesn't depend, doesn't depend on anything now. It's the sum alpha i times psi g. And again, for fun, I'll give you psi g is the sum of one of the alpha i's, all the alpha i's. So that the zero locus of these um, polynomials define interesting hypersurfaces that have been studied a fair amount in mathematics in some cases. And here, here are some examples of the corresponding amplitudes. The I2 is, is the integral. The Feynman amplitude of IB2 is 1. Um, IB3, I think this is, this is all due to David Broadhurst, is 3 times the Dirichlet L function for the unique uh, Dirichlet character mod 3, which is, which is non-trivial. So this is 3 times sum chi n n squared. Um, and we start to get more interesting numbers. IB4 equals 7 times zeta of 3, Riemann zeta value. And I think beyond that, they're not known. So these are certainly numbers which are very interesting to a number theorist. Um, and in fact, um, there are variations on this graph, variants on this integral, which are relevant to uh, the study of such Feynman integrals, which experimentally, uh, mainly, in some cases it's been proved, yield a whole array of special values of L functions of modular forms. So uh, f is f is some modular form for uh, the uh, for SL two, some congruent subgroup of SL two. So um, before continuing with the main example, uh, we, may sh we should maybe have a, a ten minute break, coffee. So this is this class of graphs is called log divergent precisely because the gamma uh, factor will produce a pole. 
but by abuse of notation, let us write IG to be um, modulo this gamma factor, what remains of this integral, and it is omega G over psi G squared. And so this is a number if it converges. Um, and it converges um, if and only if um, for every subgraph the number of loops, uh, sorry, the number of edges is strictly bigger than twice the number of loops for every strict subgraph. Um, so this is called a, this means that the big graph is primitive, it has no subdivergences. Um, so an example, an example of a graph which is log divergent is this one. So now because there are no masses and uh, no external momenta, well they play no role, I can drop them from the pictures. So this is certainly log divergent, it has four edges and two loops, but it is not primitive <coughs> because it has the subgraph 3-4 contained in it, which has um, two edges and one loop, and two times one is two. So it violates this inequality. Um, why are these, a comment for the physicist, why are these um, quantities uh, relevant? So in this case we get, a, I should say, that we get a real number. You don't get functions anymore, we just get numbers. So why are these quantities relevant for physics? Because they give renormalization scheme independent contributions to the beta function of this theory. <coughs> um, oh, I should say also, the when I write phi 4, what that means in graph theoretic terms is simply that, that the graph has no vertices of degree bigger than or equal to 5. So the, the valency of each vertex is at most 4. <laughs> okay. So here uh, um, examples. So the, these are the calculations originally due to Broadhurst and Crimer which, which started off this whole business. So one loop there's, oops, one loop, there's this graph and its amplitude is 1, just the number 1. At three loops, there's a single example of a primitive log-divergent graph, which is uh, the wheel with three spokes. And its amplitude is 6 times 6 is to 3. Um, at four loops, there's a single example, which is the wheel with four spokes. And it gives 20 z to 5. At five loops, there are several examples. Let me look at one of the most interesting ones. Um, but there, there are a couple of others. And this gives uh, 6 z to 3 squared, that's the, that's the square of this Feynman amplitude, and we, we understand why that's the case. Um, at six loops there are more examples, but the most interesting one is um, this graph, which again was computed experimentally way back when, um, but only rather recently has been proved um, 
a grizzly. Um, so, and there are many others. And here the amplitude is something complicated. It's 27 over 5 is equal to 5, 3 plus 45 over 4 is equal to 5 times equal to 3 minus 261 over 20 is equal to 8. Um, and so these calculations were first due to broadhouse Krimer numerically up to a certain degree. Um, but there's been spectacular progress in recent years going to much higher loop order and proving uh, the actual quantities rigorously um, by Panzer and Schnetz. In fact, two, they're two different. So when you say numerically, this means that they computed 12 dimensional integral with very high precision? Uh, yeah, so already for the wheel with three spokes, you're right. This is a, it has six edges, so it's a six-dimensional, five-dimensional integral. Um, the graph polynomial has 16 terms. You can't compute it that way. It's, it's, it's terrible. So you use different techniques. You use momentum space. So you, you use something called the Gegenbauer x-space technique, and you expand in terms of certain um, Gegenbauer polynomials, and then accelerate the convergence. There's a whole industry of, there's a huge literature on how to compute numerically. But that's all been superseded because um, they're now um, algorithms that do this using the parametric representation in the case of uh, Eric, who's sitting in the audience. And um, Oliver Schnetz has a different approach using single valued multiple polylogarithms. So now many of these can be done uh, much more efficiently and exactly. So these are all theorems. These are, nothing is. There's no one, no one very it's a cool theorem. Yeah, these are all, these are all true theorems, and, and they're examples now up to, up to much higher loop order, up to even 11 loops. So there's been a spectacular progress in, in recent years um, in this. But I'm, I'm, for the illustrations of today, I, I'll just look at these examples. OK, so the first observation is that there are, um, oh, sorry. So originally there were no infinite families known, but now we know that there are um, infinitely. So we know some infinite families now, some of which are explicit and some of which are just proved by general theorems, uh, which are multiple zeta values. So multiple zeta value is this. nested sum um, so these were first defined by Euler in the um, 18th century um, but now we know this an extremely long story about which I regretfully will say nothing that we, we no longer expect that at some time one did expect all these amplitudes to be multiple zetas but that is no longer the case and we do not expect multiple zeta values in general. So the, the question then is what? Uh, so um, so the now there are known examples due to, to Panzer and Schnetz where you have um, an evaluation of a Feynman integral as um, uh, an, something like an Euler sum where, or a, vari a variation of this definition where you put a root of unity. And standard transcendence conjectures predicts that it's not possible to write it in these forms. But more drastically, um, there are examples due to myself and Oliver Schnetz, where we um, proved that the um, we proved that the graph hypersurface is modular. So there's a, a piece of the cohomology is the motive of a modular form, and uh, so that's that's at eight loops. That's much more sort of catastrophic. Um, right. Putting all those unities, more or less. Yeah, but it, it, it's in the same, it's still mixed hate, yeah, if you put a root of unity. But um, a modular form changes, changes the, the, um, the, uh, the type of number completely. So the, the question is then, um, what on earth can we say in general? What is there left to say in complete generality about amplitudes at all? Given 
the, the vagaries of the examples. And um, the first thing one might toy with is some sort of invariant, some weaker invariant of multiple zeta values like the weight. So the weight of a multiple zeta value is the sum of the, of the arguments. And so let's have a look at the weights on, on these examples. So this is short of trying to compute the integral. Let's see if we can understand the weights. So let me put a column here, the weight, and put another column here, twice the loop number minus 3. And the weight here is, is 0. Um, and here, it's kind of a trivial example, so we'll ignore that. Here, the weight of zeta 3, according to this definition, is 3. And twice, 2 times 3 minus 3 is 3. Um, here, the weight of zeta 5 is 5. And uh, this quantity is, is 2 times 4 minus 3, which is 5. Here, the weight is 6. And this quantity is 7. And this integral here has weight... This multiple zeta value has weight 8, um, but 2h minus 3 is 9. So already we see that even looking at a very crude uh, invariant like the weight, we have some sort of upper bound, which is twice the loop number minus 3. But in these examples here, the bound is not attained, and we say that these examples have weight drop. So. So we see that um, even understanding the weights is a tricky business. But I, I, I should say that we actually understand the weights fairly well, at least in this, this setting. So the, the weight is the first um, hint of something motivic going on. So the prototype for and the inspiration for this entire subject is the following experiment, where we will try to compute the Galois action on fight the fourth, or the amplitudes which we know in fight the fourth theory, and in particular those which are MZVs, or close to MZVs. So, in the um, second lecture, next week, um, I will define a ring of, in inverted commas, motivic periods. It's an abuse of the word motivic, but um, I'll keep it anyway. So we have a ring that's called PM sub H, which I'll explain next time. And it comes with the following structures. It comes with a period homomorphism. from these elements of this ring to actual complex numbers. Then it comes with um, an action of an affine group scheme over Q that I'll just call G. So this group will act on this ring. And it has other structures, um, in particular, uh, an increasing weight filtration. So in general, the weight is only a filtration. But in, in the examples that we're going to look at, like multiple zeta values, it will happen that the weight is a grading, and we can speak about the weight. So there's a small abuse of terminology, but for what I'm about to say, we, we land in a subspace where the weight is a grading, and so I will, I will use the word weight as if it were a grading. But in general, one should remember that it is not. So 
don't know what it is. H, I will define that next time. It will be a, a Tanakian category of, of realizations or something. Yeah, but that, that will... I want to explain um, what a Galois theory of amplitudes means and, and I now want to explain how it would explain a lot of the structure that we see. So I think these, these examples are very striking and were the motivation for constructing this. Um, so examples, there are things called motivic multiple zeta values, which I defined a few years ago. Um, again, they actually, they actually live in a subring of uh, another ring of periods which injects into this one. So, but I'm going to identify them with that image in this. Um, so I don't think that's very drastic. Um, so they're objects corresponding to multiple zeta values and the period is the multiple zeta value. Okay, so then what can we do with this group? Well, we can define the Galois conjugates of an element in this ring. So all this will be constructed next week. The Galois conjugates will be the linear combinations of uh, the G Xi, where G is in the rational points of this group. And therefore every, in fact every um, element will generate a, a finite dimensional a finite dimensional representation that I will call V sub Xi of this group. And we will get a representation, a row, from this abstract group about which we know very little, but to a very concrete um, group of matrices. So the idea is that we want to replace actual numbers with representations of a group. So I hope that this idea should resonate with physicists, where um, the idea of replacing objects with representations of groups is familiar. So it turns out that we know how to compute um, a lot about these representations in the case of multiple zeta values. So let me um, give, give examples for this in the case of some simple multiple zeta values. So the first example is uh, even zeta values. So um, the Galois conjugates of an even zeta value are just, this, are just itself. So V in this case will be Q zeta motivic 2n. And so how does the, the group G act on um, this motivic zeta value, well, it just multiplies it by some number to the 2n. So what that means is that there exists, there exists a, a homomorphism from g to gm, which is called lambda. And um, every even zeta value gets scaled by lambda to its weight. So this is kind of a bit uninteresting. Um, to get something more interesting, we should look at odd zeta values. So now the, the, uh, the Galois conjugates
um, form the vector space spanned by one and the odds eta values. So we get now two dimensional representation and G of, of an odd zeta value is lambda G, it's the same lambda as before, so the weight plus um, I'll put it here, G. So this is in Q. So um, the, this Galois group, Matilic Galois group, if you like, takes an odd zeta value, scales it, but it can also add a rational number to it. So that's how it transforms. And so it means that we get a representation um, which in, in, in this basis, so we get G to ORT V and G in, in this basis will map to the matrix um, 1 uh, S two n plus one lambda to the two n plus one of G. So we should think of an odd, an even zeta value as a one-dimensional representation, and an odd zeta value is a two-dimensional representation. Sorry, S S is a is a it's a function from G to Q. It's a function from well G to yeah fine line. If you like, it's a function from uh, S two n plus one is a function from G Q to Q, and and this thing is a homomorphism. Let me. It's a it's a homomorphism from the additive group semi-direct, the multiplicative group. So these are functions on G, and and uh, this forms a, a group of into this group of matrices. My apologies, I forgot the zero here. Is that? Sorry? Zeta M1. N uh, uh, it's zero. Yeah, zeta material one is it. Well, you can define it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I prefer it. Yeah, you could, that's use, it's very useful in many contexts to consider it to be a, a parameter. Um, actually, here I, I prefer it to be zero. Okay. Sorry? Oh, we got called the big data. Oh, did he? Oh, I didn't know that. Um, so then we can take uh, we can take tensor products of representations as we know. So the first two examples um, tells us how to what the Galois conjugates of um, a product of an odd zeta value and an even zeta value are. So what are the Galois conjugates of this? It's um, from the two previous formulae. It's two n plus 2k plus 1, uh, the same thing. Plus, what did I call it? Um, S, 2n plus 1g, zeta metallic 2k. That just follows from multiplying the two previous uh, examples together. So in particular, the Galois conjugates of, I don't know, let's just do an example, theta uh, 3, theta 2 are elements of the vector space theta 2 and theta. In other words, you can take theta 3 times theta 2, and there's an element of the group which sends it to theta 2. Okay, for the first really interesting example is e to 3, 5. And you have to trust me on this, that there's a, there's a way to compute this, this uh, the Galois conjugates um, 
it's, a, it's a, a big subject, it would take a very long time to explain, and we won't need everything. But the, the upshot is that the Galois conjugates are um, the number itself, zeta 3 and 1. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, the reason it's non-trivial is actually follows from the fact that the zeta value is non-zero. Um, yeah, it follows from that fact. Because there's a period homomorphism and you know, you can, yeah. Um, so now we get a representation on this vector space. So G to ORT V. And in this basis, um, the um, in this basis we can write it as a matrix: one, zero, zero, uh, lambda cubed, lambda to the eight. This is S three. This is minus five times. S5, so there's some computation to be done there to obtain this minus 5. And there's some new map from G, um, set theoretic map from GQ to Q, which I call S35, such that this thing forms a, is, a, is a homomorphism of groups. So the, the convention is not, so 1 goes to 1 under GDS. Yeah, so fi yes, one goes to one. So the, the, the way you write the matrix way depends on what? I think it should be a transpose, but it doesn't matter. Maybe. Do you think I should write? Well, I've, this is Durham. Um, maybe. I <laughs> depends. If you want the matrix to multiply column vector to. <laughs> but maybe, it's, maybe I'm not doing it. I'm notoriously bad at getting my left and right mixed up. But um, yeah, well, we can discuss this. <laughs> we can discuss this. OK, convention. OK. Um, oh yeah, yeah, maybe you're right. Anyway. Okay, and then in the, um, I want to keep that. So here, I write it here. So in the third lecture, so in the second lecture, I will try to set this up so that all this has a rigorous meaning and um, works. And in the third lecture. I will define a um, motivic period, again, abuse of the word motivic, IMG, in particular, for example, for any G um, of the type we're looking at here, so primitive, uh, overall log divergent, and fight the four, but it will be much more general than that. But we're just looking at this case now. So we will get um, an analogous construction, IMG, in this same ring, and such that its period is the Feynman amplitude we want, which by these assumptions converged, as I said earlier. And then the key observation. which is the whole purpose of this series of talks, is that the subspace spanned by the motivic Feynman amplitudes is, um, is in brackets, nearly, it's, it's in some precise sense, but the, the, the story is slightly more complicated than it at first seems, is actually closed under this Galois action. Um, so the goal is to make this precise. So in, in some sense, um, Cartier's original dream was that the um, 
that the, the Feynman the, the, there should be a group acting on Feynman amplitudes, and it should be the same group as the one acting on multiple Z2As. But since we have all these counterexamples and these complications, that can't be true. But the, the point is then, there is such a group acting on amplitudes, but now it's not at all clear that it actually preserves the space of amplitudes. There's no reason why if you take an amplitude and take its Galois conjugate, it should still be an amplitude. And that um, is nearly the case and is an absolutely astonishing fact. And um, I will now try to explain to you why it's such an astonishing fact on these examples. So this, this fact has extraordinary um, predictive power for the amplitudes. So the purpose of, of this talk was really to try to motivate this entire construction with, with the examples I'm going to give now. So as a, um, to test out the validity of these ideas, let's take these amplitudes which are computed as, as multiple zeta values and just put a little m, put a little m everywhere. That's reasonable because there's um, the standard transcendence conjecture for multiple zeta values uh, suggests that the, um, the period map on, multiple, on metallic multiple zeta values is injective, and everyone believes this. So that's not, um, that's not a big price to play. So let us assume the transcendence conjecture for MZVs, and then do the following experiment. Um, so then, um, so Ol what Oliver Schnetz did is he took these, the vast data of amplitudes that were now known in uh, for fight the four theory, and he computed the uh, Galois conjugates of all of them, and he um, made the following conjecture based on that numerical evidence, which is that the periods. Um, sorry, the, the vector space spanned by the motivic amplitudes for G as above, primitive, overall log divergent, in fact, the four theory is, clo is closed under the Galois action, action of G. So this uh, has not appeared yet. It will be written up in a paper with, um, joined with Eric Panzer, I believe, who's made many contributions. Um, so let's assume this conjecture is true. And as a thought experiment, let's go through the consequences of this conjecture. So from now on, let's just assume that the conjecture is true and draw consequences from that. And let's assume that in all the examples that we're going to look at, that we know that the amplitude is a multiple zeta value. So in fact, there are theorems that will guarantee this in, in even infinite families of examples. So that's, that's not much to assume. And let's assume in these examples that we can predict the weight. And that's also the case. I have a paper with Karen Schnetz in which we explain how to predict the weight, at least in low degrees. Um, okay, so, ah, I'm out of space. Um, okay, so we need, um, so let's assume that these amplitudes, assume that we know that these amplitudes are multiple zeta values, and we know their weights. That's not much to assume. So here's a table um, Here's a table. I run out of board space. <laughs> um, OK, I'll try and squeeze it on here. Here's a table of multiple zeta values up to weight eight. So the weight. One, two, three. 
So these are the numbers which we expect to find at least at low degrees coming out as amplitudes in fight the four theory. And here I will write a basis for the space of Mativic MZVs in that weight. So in weight 0, there's just the number 1. In weight 1, there's nothing. In weight 2, there's zeta Mativic 2 and nothing else. In weight 3, there's zeta Mativic 3 and nothing else. In weight 4, zeta Mativic 4 and nothing else. In weight 5, there's zeta mativic 5 and zeta mativic 3 times zeta mativic 2. In weight 6, there's zeta mativic 6 and zeta mativic 3 squared. In weight 7, zeta mativic 7, zeta mativic 5, zeta mativic 2. Zeta mativic 3, zeta mativic 4. And in weight 8, we get zeta mativic 5, 3. This is interesting. Before I, I wrote 3, 5, but this is, you can take 5, 3, it's the same. Um, zeta mativic 5, zeta mativic 3. Sorry. Let me put zeta mativic 8 at the top. Then zeta mativic 3 squared, zeta mativic 2. Zeta mativic 5, zeta mativic 3. And the first mativic multiple zeta value that is not a product of things which came before, 5, 3. OK. So here we go. Let's, uh, we have these data of, of numbers. And we have this correction conjecture, and we have these graphs. So let's um, let's put the pieces together. Let's assume this conjecture. Okay. So um, first of all, there is no graph whose amplitude is a multiple of zeta 2. There can't be, because, because we know something about the weights. It would correspond to a, a graph with, with two and a half loops. Or it could correspond to a three-loop graph, which has a drop in the weight. But there is only one three-loop graph. It's there. So there cannot be a graph whose period is zeta 2. So then the, the, the correction conjecture says that um, but I think now you don't assume that you know the value of this graph. Um, no, I'm saying I just assume I know the weights. So I know that this graph has weight three. So and and there are no graphs in between the the one loop graph and the three loop graph. There's, so there's no space to have a zeta two. There cannot be a zeta two in in this theory, and that implies that there are no numbers whose conjugates are zeta two that can ever occur. So this implies that the number zeta, any zeta odd times zeta 2 can never occur to any loop order. So we take our table of MZVs and we strike out, having struck out the zeta 2, the correction conjecture tells us that this number can't occur, this number can't occur, and this number can't occur and so on ad infinitum. So let's do an example. So example in weight 5, let's compute the, the 5, sorry, the, the for loop amplitude by pure thought. We know we have a graph here, and we know that its weight is 5. So a priori, the amplitude since we're assuming it's a, we know it's a multiple zeta value, should be in this vector space of weight 5. So it's a, a, a rational multiple of zeta 5 plus a rational multiple of zeta 3, zeta 2. So what would its conjugates be by the examples I worked out laboriously beforehand? 
the conjugates would be the number 1, beta zeta motivic of 2, and the amplitude itself. But we know the conjecture implies that the conjugates must correspond to graphs. But there is no graph corresponding to zeta 2, so that forces beta equal to 0. So it tells us that the amplitude um, cannot be an arbitrary linear combination. It has to be a multiple of zeta 5. Okay. We keep going. Can you repeat the argument about y dropping? So if you go to very high loop order and so as soon as the y drops very drastically, so you go to y2? So um, the, the weight is, is, is tricky. So we can understand um, when graphs don't have a weight drop and we c in, in some infinite families of cases, and we can guarantee that there's one weight drop. So there are combinatorial criteria where you can just look at this graph and see immediately that it has to have one weight drop. But predicting two or three or more weight drops is very tricky. And there's no, there's no general recipe where you give me a graph and I can write down the weight. So you don't have a bound? There's an upper bound. So there's an upper bound. The upper bound is it's always 2h minus 3. And, um, and sometimes that bound goes, no, no lower bound. You could have um, Good point, yeah. So I'm, I'm assuming, <laughs> I said I assumed you know the weights. But um, um, there are, yeah, you can get a lower bound using, um, I will come to that in the fourth lecture. So um, in, in Hodge theory, there's, there's an upper and lower bound on weights. So they're two different things. One is, can, can we predict when their weight drops? That, that's the question I just answered. But in Hodge theory, you know that the, the cohomology Hn of, a, of, a, of a, a smooth variety has weights between n and 2n. So there's a, there's a lower bound as well. You have, to, you have to apply that. So in some sense, there is a lower bound. I'll, I'll explain that in the fourth lecture if you Sorry? Consequence of Hodge theory, but in some sense that gives a lower bound, which which means that beyond a certain point, um, beyond a certain point, the only way you could get a zeta two is uh, you, you have you have to do the whole theory. Yeah, but maybe just one remark that yeah. there is a conjecture that there is a lower bound which grows with the loop number. So we have this upper bound with two times loop number, okay. roughly, and one of the many conjectures uh, from the data we have is that also there is a lower bound growing linearly with the number of loops. Okay. So there are examples where you have triple weight drops in the high loop orders, but it's always and with each loop also the upper bound goes grows by two and the lower bound experimentally seems to grow by one. Yeah. It's a non trivial. Yeah. Um, I don't know how I can answer this satisfactorily without referring forwards, but um, um, yeah, the, the 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 weight is something extremely subtle and we're very far from understanding it. There's no no recipe that predicts there, there are some, some, some theorems that tell you from the common talks of the graph that there's a one weight drop, but the two weight drops is, is out of reach for now. I don't know whose question I'm answering. Um, okay, so now continue. So likewise, by staring um, at the examples, um, there is no, no graph corresponds to zeta 4 or zeta 6, because there's just not room. Um, so now let's look at six loops. So let's look at this example here. So most six loop graphs have weight 9, and they're, they're going to be not very interesting amplitudes because of this, this, this coaxial structure, this Galois structure. Um, but let's look at a weight drop case is going to be weight 8 and is going to give something interesting. So this graph here again. Um, so a priori the amplitude in this basis is going to be alpha zeta 3 zeta 5 plus beta zeta 3 5 plus gamma zeta 8 plus delta zeta 3 squared zeta 2 
And the correction conjecture is also, we've already established that there should be no zeta 2 as a conjugate of this graph, so that goes out. Um, oh, I should update this. So this should be out and this should be out. But we are allowed to have the conjugates of any possible linear combination from the calculations I gave earlier can be amongst the numbers 1, zeta 3, zeta 5, and the amplitude itself. Um, but that's okay because these, these numbers do occur as previous amplitudes. Yeah, one way to answer this, this weight conjecture, weight, weight thing, is that the, the coaction should, it should uh, uh, respect the, uh, it should respect the number of edges. So if you haven't seen a zeta 2 so far, you're not going to see it. Um, you're not going to see it now. Um, finally, okay, so these do, these do occur as amplitudes. And let's do one, more, one final example. Um, at weight 11. So this would correspond to a seven loop graph, which until a few, few years ago was totally beyond uh, what was computable or even foreseeably computable. So at seven loops, a multiple zeta graph would involve the following periods. So here's a basis of uh, the Mativic multiple zeta values at weight 11. And This is wrong, this should be cubed. 9 plus 2 is 11. Zeta metric 9. Okay, so sorry for that. So this is a basis of, of metric MZVs in weight 11. And it is nine dimensional. And the correction conjecture tells us we're not allowed, we don't see zeta twos and zeta fours and zeta sixes as previous graphs. So these numbers should not be showing up as amplitudes. And so what we do now is we take a, um, a seven loop graph. So I should say these are extraordinarily difficult to compute these amplitudes. Um, but I pick a random seven loop graph, which is called P78. And you compute its amplitude, and you find, after a huge amount of work, that it can be written in this basis of multiple zeta values. And you get some coefficients out. And you, indeed, you notice that these, the coefficients of all these four quantities vanish in accordance with the correction conjecture. But then the correction conjecture goes beyond that. It, it says that if one computes the correction on these numbers, um, you could certainly find something of weight 8. And so it would have to land in a space spanned by the periods of, fight of amplitudes in fight the 4 theory. And if you work out what the correction conjecture tells you, Or the Galois action conjecture, sorry, Galois action conjecture. 
implies that some constraint on these numbers. In fact, it implies precisely that 3024 over 5, the ratio should be exactly equal to the ratio of zeta 3, 5 to zeta 8 over there. So 27 over 5 over 261 over 20. And you can check that that's indeed correct. So I hope that this illustrates that this Karshan conjecture gives some extra extraordinarily subtle constraints on the possible amplitudes, um, which, which up to now has not been uh, um, considered at all. Yeah, so the coaction, you, you take this quantity and you compute the coaction. So zeta 11 is primitive, it's not going to give anything. So it's the only things, so we're looking for things that will be um, conjugates of the form uh, zeta 5, 3 or zeta 8. And the, the second one in this basis was chosen in such a way that its Galois conjugate was zeta 5 times zeta 3. Because it's a, and then so the only ones that can occur are the third one and the fourth one. And so the, the co-action sends, so the Galois action sends the third one and the fourth one to zeta 5, 3 and zeta 8, respectively. And the zeta 5, 3 and zeta 8 have to occur in a combination that has previously occurred in the quantum field theory. Because this, is, this weird combination of numbers here, the only way it, it comes in into fight the fourth theory is that zeta 5, 3 and zeta 8 always occur with, uh, with this constant of proportionality. And so you, have a, you do your six loop calculation once, and that gives you some information at a completely different loop order by, by this conjecture. So I, I find this absolutely astonishing that, um, that uh, knowing something in, in low degrees um, gives you constraints to all orders in perturbation theory. So um, it was these calculations that motivated this story. So um, there are about 250 examples that have been checked by, um, by Oliver Schnetz and Panzer of this type. The conjecture has been up to 11 loops. Um, the constraints, as I hope I explained, that this correction puts on the amp possible amplitudes actually gets stronger as you go higher, um, as the loop order increases. So normally, it's the opposite. In physics, you can just do things at very low, low loop orders. Here we see something where it's getting more and more powerful as the order increases. And indeed, um, the dimension of the space of amplitudes um, is exactly 4, which sits inside dimension of space of MZVs, weight 11 equals 9. So the physics is choosing a, a, a very special subclass of numbers. And that class of numbers is entirely predicted by this, um, this Galois action. So you had a five-dimensional, five but, but the, the, the point was that um, here we had a, um, a three-dimensional space of possible amplitudes, zeta 5, 3, zeta 5, 2, zeta 8. There's another graph that gives zeta 5, zeta 3. And at six loops, um, you only get a two-dimensional space out of the full possible three dimensions. I forgot to say that. I, my apologies. I should have said, made that more clear. So the fact that that, that, that explains, um, yeah, so I should have said that more clearly here, that you have, um, yeah, sorry, I, I omitted a line here. I should have said that at six loops, you only get a two out of three dimensional space and that will propagate up for all higher loop orders and you see it occurring here. 
that constraint and feeds. Is there any uh, Zagi type conjecture about these dimension in higher uh, width? None whatsoever, because the, um, in general we don't get multiple zeta values. So, and f for such numbers, this conjecture will be even stronger because it will predict um, uh, you'll get a, a much bigger space of possible periods and you'll be in a, in a very small uh, subspace. So there's a very striking example due to Schnetz and Panzer where um, you have a, an Euler sum. So you have um, uh, min minus one to some power here. And the space of Euler sums at that dimension is hundreds, I believe. And the, the conjecture tells you that it has to sit in, a, in a, a vector space of dimension, which is a tiny fraction of that. I don't know what the precise numbers are. Yeah, so it goes from 400 down to 5 or something. So if the numbers are not multiple zeta values, this becomes a stronger and stronger prediction because you're in a bigger box of, of possible periods. Um, and so the purpose of the remaining lectures will be to prove a version, a weaker variant of this conjecture. So it will be much weaker, but, um, but it will be valid for arbitrary masses and momenta as well. Does this account for the year close that you mentioned before? Um, yes. So the, 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 po the problem will be that when you, the, the Galois conjugate of a graph in fight the fourth theory, the way, if you do the mathematics, you expect um, graphs with higher vert, vert in fight the five theory or five to six theory. So you can get, it involves contracting edges in the graph, which will increase the degrees of the vertices. So it could just be that um, this conjecture is true because, um, uh, because the amplitudes in, higher degree vertices are no more complicated than the ones with four vertices at, at this loop order, uh, up to up this far on the picture. So it could be that this conjecture goes wrong in, in higher loops. Um, but um, yeah, that's exactly the precisely the, the statement of weaker. So it's not clear what, whether the conjecture is true. Um, that's one reason why my name isn't on the conjecture, because I'm nervous about it. Um, Oliver is a braver man than I am, and uh, the eminence is, is, is phenomenal. Um, but we don't know yet whether such a strong sort of statement can be. And so very briefly, the, what is the plan for the, for the sequel? In the second lecture, I will be just pure mathematics. I will talk about motivic periods. I will try to do everything in that lecture. It will be completely independent from this one. The third lecture, I will talk about um, graph motives. There'll be some algebraic geometry relating to graph hypersurfaces, and it will be totally independent from the previous lecture. And in the fourth lecture, I'll put everything together and define cosmic Galois group and uh, small graphs. <coughs> Thank you.